Let's start with kind of the challenges of U.S.-based kind of siting of renewables. And I'll really turn to Davi to maybe set the stage for that because we don't need slides for that necessarily. And then hopefully at that time, we can go back to Kinder to kind of talk about the deployment challenge. So yeah. Great. You Thank you. I work for a company called Apex Clean Energy. So we are mostly utility scale wind and solar, but we also do distributed solar, battery storage, and now green fuels as well. So we are working really hard on siting a whole lot of large infrastructure. And as we look at the landscape, and we'll show you this um, slide when, we, when they come up, there are a lot of different ways that these projects are permitted in the US. Um, when we at our company talk about barriers to the clean energy transition, we talk really about two primary barriers at this point. One, transmission, which you've all probably heard about and talked about, very important, very difficult. Number two, local permitting. So most of the places in the country, and like I said, we'll show you the map, where we need to build these projects are places where local governments, and by that I mean county governments, township governments, planning commissions, these are the groups that determine whether these projects get built or not. And it's really, um, it's really no exaggeration to say that energy policy in America is set by local planning commissions in many small rural communities around the country. What's happening in those planning commissions is often very, very contentious discussion about whether or not to site these large infrastructure projects in people's backyards. And planning commissions and county commissions, as you can imagine, have a very limited um, purview when they're being asked to do their job. Their mandate is to look after the very small you know, area of land that is in their jurisdiction. Um, many of the reasons why we're building these projects are not to serve that jurisdiction, probably. They're often to serve larger goals. And so there's a, there's an, a natural conflict there. OK, we're ready. Uh, pause. Kendra. <laughs> Thank you for teeing that up. Um, OK, so I will kick us off with the Biden-Harris administration climate goals. Um, you can see the um, just the, the vast amount of wind and solar that we will need. Um, it will likely make up um, between you know, 60 and 80 percent of our electricity mix by 2035. And um, this is just to show how much we'll, we'll need um, in a very short amount of time. And then uh, what does this mean for our land use? Um, so the scale of deployment needs land at an unprecedented pace. So um, you can see, you know, this shows different um, uh, you know, different sorts of development um, and the, the land that will be required. Um, you can see the solar and wind kind of hovering over uh, Virginia, North Carolina, and Alabama. This, um, this is a lot of land, um, and the scale of deployment will likely affect a lot of communities. Um, and, you know, I think you've probably, you, you've heard these goals, these ambitious climate goals, um, maybe even seen these graphics from our renewable energy uh, laboratory. Um, but I would also like to, you know, just share our DOE objective um, and, and, and reframe a little bit of the conversation today. And we were talking about, you know, communities um, that, that will be, by, be harmed by this. And, you know, what we are really, what is driving our work at the office um, that I work at at DOE is really to think about how do we minimize those social, those environmental impacts, and how do we maximize the benefits, right? So DOE, um, you know, traditionally has been working really hard to commercialize these technologies, and now that they um, are, you know, commercially available, how um, do we make sure that these technologies get, get built in a way that really benefit the communities that need to live um, near them and look at them? And how do we design um, you know, processes that are transparent and fair? Um, how do we design them in ways that are, provide real tangible benefits to the community members? So um, that is our kind of our, our, our driving goal and something that myself and my, our team think about um, on, a, on a daily basis um, and you know um, and what happens and Davi will get into this more but what happens when communities are not brought into the process um, and I'm sure you've all read in New York Times and listen to podcasts right about um, and 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 seen it yourself um, some of you and and 
what happens when um, you know there is public opposition to some of this development. So the potential impact of siting restrictions on deployment is shown here. So NREL has kind of modeled this out nationally, and if you look at the you know the the reference scenario in the upper right hand corner versus the lower left, um, the the big difference here are the local um, siting requirements and the setbacks. That's one method that um, local governments are using to restrict development in their um, their areas, and this creates a 70% drop in um, in deployment um, potential. So that is a huge challenge, um, and and that's a you know a really big obstacle if we're going to meet those goals that we talked about earlier that are ambitious, um, and we need to to you know. Um, work really quickly towards those goals. Um, I think that um, probably kind of sets up the context a little bit, and I'll pass it to Davi to, to dive into more. Thank you. Yeah. So picking up, uh oh, okay, picking up right from there. So I have to give Kendra and her team credit for this slide too. These maps are are showing what I was describing. Um, so for wind and solar, these maps are showing who has siting permitting authority in each of these states. And you can see that in most of the states in the US, and certainly the windiest states, um, it's often local governments who determine whether projects are allowed to be built or not. So I was starting to tell you a little bit about uh, what these conversations are often like. And we, we can get more into it if you're interested uh, in the questions. But but in, in our experience, these, these processes in local in local land use, these local, local land use boards that are responsible for these decisions, they get overrun by, by, by contention. They're not always prepared for that. You know, these are often very small communities. Uh, these are not usually professional boards. These are usually, you know, volunteer boards and they have other jobs. They are uh, often farmers in many of the places where we're, where we're working. And so they're not necessarily prepared for an issue to come to their community that's going to tear it apart. And, and really, quite literally, that is what is happening in a lot of these places. Neighbors are turning against neighbors. Friends are not friends anymore. Families are getting into feuds. People are boycotting businesses. Death threats are being made. And many of you all, many of you live in the US, and you're probably you know, aware of how some of these kinds of conversations are breaking down all over the place on all kinds of issues. But it's definitely happening around clean energy. So uh, there's there are these boards are often not prepared for that. And they're often overwhelmed by the misinformation that's available on the internet. Um, there's a lot of fear mongering about clean energy. So Kendra was talking about, you know, the burdens uh, that face rural communities around these projects. There are burdens. These are large facilities and you see them. But there are not in, there is not evidence that there are health burdens, or that there are significant environmental burdens for a lot of these uh, projects. So really, we're we're having to try to figure out how to have conversations that can get down to factual information, um, answer people's honest questions about appropriate trade offs and sense of place in communities. And most I would I would argue that most of the processes that we've been a part of in local governments aren't really well designed for those kinds of conversations. And so later on, we'll talk a little bit about something we tried uh, on that front, but I think it's a good place to turn it over. All right, good. So we, we want to uh, turn next to actually community, and, and it's a little bit different in the sense that for offshore wind, unlike onshore wind and solar, there's a different regulatory environment. So most offshore wind is going to be sited three miles or more beyond state boundaries or controls of waters. It's going to be in federal waters. The Bureau of Energy Ocean Management, BOEM, is essentially the kind of permitting authority, along with many, many others that the mayor will talk about in a second in terms of offshore wind. But communities as well are going to be a very much affected by that as well, and specifically communities that depend on commercial and recreational fishing. So I really want to turn it to the mayor of New Bedford to really describe his experience so far. All right. Well, thanks, Pat. I guess I'm, I'm on now. Uh, great to see everyone. So, yeah, so what I'm about to say or I'm about to describe um, in a, a few short minutes is uh, a, a situation that may seem somewhat peculiar, somewhat unique to our circumstances. But what I, would, I hope the takeaway is maybe a, a way, an approach to – to dealing with with conflict among um, uh, among a whole array of interests, and so this has to do with uh, the offshore uh, wind industry, right? Uh, so, for those of you who are familiar with the industry, it's been maturing for the last thirty years, uh, especially in Northern Europe, and to a lesser extent in China, although China is rapidly catching up. Um, right now, there are five thousand uh, over five thousand turbines spinning in the North Sea. And uh, there are a total of seven in U.S. waters. 
that's all about to change. The Biden administration has set a very ambitious goal for 30 gigawatts of offshore wind to be installed by 2030, and that's only seven years away. So not, uh, it's it's really ambitious, and so. Uh, altogether, those who are involved are heading headlong toward that that goal. And even if it's not even met, even if it's just halfway met, that will be a whole lot of development. The industry is about to kick off in earnest in the next two months when the Vineyard Wind Project deploys from the Port of New Bedford starting in May, and that'll take place over the, the, the next year. That'll be uh, a $3.2 billion project, 800 megawatts, and that is the first of some 17 projects that are in some uh, state of permitting review just on the East Coast. We could spend the whole time today talking about offshore wind. What's unusual uh, for us in New Bedford is uh, the potential conflicts with the commercial fishing industry. And I don't know if we have, oh, there's the first slide. So that, so that first slide just simply depicts just uh, the, the scale of commercial fishing that goes on uh, out of the port of New Bedford. Right? So the, land, the annual landings in New Bedford are about, f are about five times uh, the next largest East Coast port, where the, uh, the highest grossing commercial fishing port in the United States. And, and we also have the largest seafood processing base in the United States. We are to seafood what Omaha is, is to beef. So we just go to the next slide. So this is the my slide deck of two. So you know, I, I think that, but but you can see here from the map, um, it, we are uh, the closest port to the center mass of the wind energy areas on the east coast. The Mass Rhode Island wind energy area is just south of us, and so we that is why we are in the thick of things. And so you can and you can see how the rest of the uh, approved offshore wind uh, lease areas have been. Uh, where, where, they're, where they're generally located as you go down the East Coast. There are a couple that have been uh, approved since this was done. I use this, by the way, for a European audience. I made the star for New Bedford bigger than New York City. Just, and I, I, didn't get any, I didn't get any pushback at all. So, but you can see from this map, um, you, can, you can see from this map where, where the conflict is. You have these two industries that are vying for natural resources in the same general area of the outer continental shelf of the Atlantic, right? So, uh, and the conflicts are, are, are very real. They're not NIMBYism-type conflicts, right? It's these, these are all facilities that will be uh, situated beyond the horizon from, sh from the shoreline, but uh, they, are, they have to do with navigational safety, right? Big, big fixed-bottom fixed, uh, fixed bottom turbines uh, in the middle of areas where fishermen either fish or sail is, is a problem in an industry that is very dangerous to, be, to begin with, but also... Uh, the prospect of lost economic opportunity. If you put wind farms in places where fishermen fish or where fish spawn, that in itself uh, poses risk to, uh, to the viability of the fishing industry in the long run. So what have we done? So because of our status as the, the center of the commercial fishing industry on the East Coast and as an older industrial city that sees offshore wind as a as a unique opportunity to regenerate our economic base and create jobs for for people in a in a city that has had a is a legacy manufacturing center, we need to figure out how to facilitate successful coexistence of the two. So this is something we've been at for a number of years now, and the approach that we've taken is I think one that is instructive for the siting of energy facilities anywhere in the country, and, and that is this. We have decided, and this may not be smart politics, I don't know if there are any political consultants here, but we have decided to situate ourselves in the loneliest place in American politics, the middle, right in the middle, right? So uh, I have um, you know, put my own personal credibility on the, on the line to essentially be an arbiter of fact, right? We have, in, we have facilitated a discussion that is grounded in fact, um, so that when one side or the other has to be called on something that's not quite right, we do it. We're, we don't hesitate to do that. Um, we convene all the right folks, so everybody has a seat at the table. Uh, everybody has a chance to, to say something, and not everything that's said at the table is, is right, but everybody is respected. Relationships are maintained to the greatest extent possible. And, we, um, and because... We do that. We have, I think, an outsized say and a, a whole lot of what's happened. And I'll just, because time is, is, um, is limited right now, I'll just say where we are. I think it's, 
it's an ongoing process. I will not say it's a success story because it's a there are more chapters ahead as the offshore industry is about to launch in the U.S. But I will say this: we the the, the industry is going forward. We want the industry going forward. We want New Bedford to be in, in the middle of it, and it's all about to start happening, and we're well positioned, right, for the benefit of our folks economically as well as uh, to be part of what I think is one of the primary pillars of the U.S.'s offshore, uh, the U.S.'s uh, climate mitigation strategy. Secondly, the fishing industry is working and gaining economic opportunity to work with the uh, offshore wind industry, right? They're, they're getting paid to do things like uh, to pull security around the wind uh, construction, wind energy construction sites. There are fueling companies that are getting business. There are a number of uh, existing businesses that are now getting opportunities that wouldn't have otherwise been available to them. Um, and third, I think people feel like, just in general, like they've, they've had their say that this is a way forward and it makes makes sense. And so their their interests, they feel like their interests have been vindicated. Um, so uh, it's going okay so far. If you ask people on either side, n- n- neither would say it's been perfect. And as I, and again, as the person in the middle of it, I'm perfectly willing to absorb the slings and arrows of, of that of that discussion. But I think that's the way to do it when it comes to citing just about any kind of new energy facility. You have to be able just to be credible and just you know, just state the facts, just the facts, ma'am. Right. Uh, that's, that is, that, I think that's the, the, the way forward and it, it might not work everywhere, but it's, I think it's largely work for us. We want to then tell a little bit of a not so happy story. <laughs> so, uh, Brad and myself and Davi worked on a project in Vermilion County, Indiana, and we want to kind of share that case study because I think in that effort, we really tried a lot of best practices to no avail. Um, and so uh, Davi's going to kind of explain the case a little bit, and then Brad's going to, I think, really tease out some lessons. Then we'll have a bit of conversation, and then I'll really open it up to the floor. So, Davi, over to you. So we were working on a project in Vermilion County, Indiana, which is a, a long, skinny county um, on the west side of Indiana. Um, and this is a place where uh, we, we identified this county as a place for a wind project because there's wind. <laughs> uh, but also, as I mentioned, there was transmission access. And that is such a, such a key element of where you can put a project now. Uh, we went to where, where we could put it, and this is one of the places. So we just, we've just we lived through a whole lot of these really, really contentious siting fights around the country. And we've asked ourselves over the years, is there a better way to have these conversations? Um, and being a student of some of the social science uh, on this topic and uh, justice, procedural justice issues, we thought we'd try something that we think was pretty radical. What if you let the community decide where the project goes? What if you invite them to the table and ask them to help you design it? What if you sort of teach them what has to go into designing a feasible wind project and then let them teach you about what's going to fit in this place? We wanted to have a conversation that was rooted in the values of the community, started there, you know, ideally was something that they felt would support those values. Um, and we did a couple of really other things that were pretty unique. Number one, we invited third party facilitators to come uh, help us with this process, which is which is unusual in our in our space. Um, but also we offered a one percent royalty in the project. So this was a way to provide additional community benefit um, in addition to the types of tax revenues and, and landowner payments and economic kind of infusion of economic uh, investment that typically comes with these projects, we added this extra piece, which was a a 1% royalty on the project for the community to use any way that it wanted to use it. Um, And our thought there was, if we can create an incentive that aligns their incentives with ours, you know, give them a reason to be interested in a more productive project, that will be an important piece of designing a good project together. And therefore, if we design a, a better project, they will get more revenue from it as well, and that'll that'll kind of put us on equal footing with what we're trying to achieve. Um, so we started right out the gate by uh, going to the community and asking about the values, what they thought mattered in this place, what was most important. And we, we really, really struggled and, and tried to get um, a lot of participation from members of the general public um, on, on these issues. We asked them where they thought the money should go. Um, we asked them where they thought it should be cited. And uh, quickly, since we're quick on time here, we, we unfortunately did not succeed in getting anyone to participate. Um, a huge barrier for us there was trust, and this is going to be a theme you might hear, and you've already heard a, li- a little bit. 
this is the, the currency that is most valuable um, in these efforts, trust, because there's a ton of information that anybody can find in the internet. And there is a ton of, there are a ton of studies on every topic that is gonna come up and it's really, really confusing. And the only way that you end up getting people to join, to see your facts as the facts, uh, is if they trust you. And at the end of the day, we think that de as a developer, as a private company, we, we just could not gain the trust of the community to run a process like that. Um, and as, as a result, we didn't get buy-in. But I think Brad's gonna talk more about what, what he saw as one of the, the facilitators working on this, and then we can, we can dive more into this if you'd like. Um, I will say we, we did write up an 80-page postmortem of this experiment, which we can we can share. Um, but because it was a, a such a different way to do things, we thought it was really valuable to share our lessons learned. Um, so happy to share that. Okay. Thanks, Davi. Uh, I cannot see the screen, so I'm going to rely on various cues from you to indicate to me whether I'm talking about what you're seeing. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Citing processes, we're talking about energy facilities of any kind or infrastructure, whether those processes are collaborative, consent-based or not, they're inherently pretty unique, especially for um, types of facilities, and I think wind energy farms um, is near the top of the list, that are particularly complex. Um, likely to be controversial. So here are... Um, Davi promised some lessons learned, which I'll, I'll try and spoon out in a, a couple different layers. But here's some elements likely to be helpful in signaling at least a genuine intent to collaborate, to be welcoming, inclusive, share power. Um, the entry point, I think we knew going in, but learned uh, pretty profoundly, the entry point's very powerful um, and important to signal what kind of welcome or partner you're looking for not so much champions of a project where it can be construed that you're trying to prejudice the outcome but really you know a, a local convener someone to sponsor a process to serve as a tempering influence um, and, and i think in vermilion county indiana uh, it may not have been the right time in sort of the arc of political change locally but we also never really found ourselves that partner um, you know, when you reach out, um, if, it, if there is a, a discernible trail of easement acquisition going on, if anyone glimpses a, a project map, however speculative, um, community members can quickly assume that a developer or siting agency is further along than is actually the case. Um, certainly, you know, be straightforward about the intent, the hope of building a project. But um, you know, as Dobby indicated and very much embodied through um, the experience we shared, openness to where it happens, uh, under what conditions, um, w with what benefits at stake, and whether it happens. Um, maintaining, and, and this is where I think we, we um, learned a bit, uh, we, there were a number of junctures where we had to decide um, how active and vocal to be, uh, both as the independent facilitation team and also as the, the developer everybody was trying to size up. Um, but I think overall we came out thinking, you know, be active, be on the ground, um, not as a project advocate, but as a process advocate, um, serving as a, a technical resource when invited, but mainly just um, extolling um, the value of a proposed collaborative approach. And as Davi mentioned, um, you know, learning about and then reflecting back and understanding of the community. What happened before you got there? How do things work around there? And what does the community think about how they already gather and deliberate and decide? Um, so again, yeah, point of entry, process sponsor. Um, we, we definitely experience the phenomenon of information, accurate or not, credible or not, um, moving faster than the, sort of the, the unfolding of the collaborative process um, and the developer signaling their intentions. So 
uh, I think looking back, um, I would say, well, look to myself, looking forward, don't count on any kind of reconnaissance, however subtle, going unnoticed or being interpreted correctly. Um, you know, members of the community, if they are at all curious, agitated, if there's a history of um, pr promises broken or feeling coerced or marginalized, their residents are talking to their neighbors and, and most likely being found through social media and other means by activists, communities that have been through a harrowing experience somewhere else. Um, and where I think we were silent, fine-tuning the collaborative process, um, imagination was running wild and filling in the gaps. Um, so what does the developer or siting agency need to understand? Um, you know, how they're perceived, local history with expectations of contentious siting, um, any history perceived or, or actual earned experience of being underserved, overburdened, is this, does this feel like the kind of thing that gets done to communities like mine? Um, and again, you know, how a community already gathers and expects to make decisions like this. Uh, and where I, I wish we had been able to peel back more layers of the onion is um, how does the community, how do community members feel about how their customs and practices of gathering and, and decision making work for them? Do they, are they inclusive enough? Are they transparent enough? Are they, are they centering equity and make in ways that reflect the values of the community? And we had a number, it wasn't that people weren't willing to talk to us, but the folks who opted in were likely to say something along the lines of, and this is certainly a composite, um, I'm glad that Apex is doing it, I'm glad they're doing it this way with the involvement of a team like yours. Um, I wanna help however I can, just please for the love of God, don't use my name or ask me to show up any place because I, you know, either A, I don't want my neighbors madder at me than they already are, or B, I only have so much social and political capital to use in this community, and this isn't at the top of my list, so good luck, and call me anytime. Um, and uh, so finally, I, I don't know how many of you were at yesterday evening's plenary session, uh, I was really glad to hear um, one of the speakers, Tom Steyer, talk about the challenge of finding a community willing to serve as a host, however temporary, uh, however prolonged, for spent nuclear fuel, um, which is a, a, another issue I think many of us in this kind of civic engagement space think about. So zooming out, um, I, I wanted to invite a little bit of scope stretching uh, the conversations around siting of renewable fuel. Um, is it time to imagine some kind of what the screen I think says independent hub? Is that the right slide? Okay, good. Um, a, a community of communities, a community of practice that allows you know, a community that's going up this learning curve being contacted maybe by Apex to, f to find New Bedford. <laughs> someone like um, the, the mayor to my right, to, to hear about those experiences in a way that's unfiltered by um, the interests of a developer. Um, maybe some way of, of curating information in a credible way, a court, uh, using um, transparent and, and evolving standards. Um, and then separate from any citing issue, um, is the community ready for the conversation that you want to have? There's so much psychic energy being spent figuring out how to, to calibrate a collaborative approach from the standpoint of a developer. Is the community ready for that conversation? Do they have the capability, the capacity, the confidence um, to engage in, in a way? So uh, very interested in thoughts about how to elevate um, any community's civic engagement in a way that's respectful of their history and values. And with that, I'll pass it back. A conversation and from Kinder about some of the resources DOE is trying to bring to this problem. Okay, so you've probably all taken away that this is um, a very complex issue, um, a lot of challenges, but I'm going to try to 
end on a positive note and talk about some of the solutions, some of the things that we are trying to um, develop at DOE. So um, I lead the Siting and Permitting Working Group at DOE, and this is a new team. We are about a year old. Um, of course, there's a lot of work that predates um, you joining DOE, but uh, we are, you know, across multiple technologies, working really hard to to try to um, create some new solutions. And um, previous to DOE, I worked at NYSERDA, worked um, kind of in the evenings and weekends. I was at town hall meetings, working with local officials, providing technical assistance on the very long list of real concerns, like the mayor had mentioned, right? There's real um, real questions that need real information, uh, to, and to Davi's point, from a, a trusted source of information. Um, so that uh, a little bit about um, you know my background in coming to this role, but we wanted to kind of test that theory on a, a national scale and see what are the challenges. Before DOE develops new tools and resources, let's make sure we're addressing the real challenges, and let's talk to um, state energy offices, let's talk to industry, let's talk to um, local officials and community-based organizations and university extensions. Um, the kind of wide and um, complex network of folks that are, are involved in, in these siting decisions. Um, so this led to a, a much better understanding of the challenges, um, and and you know not very su surprising the the challenges that I heard in upstate New York are similar to the ones in Michigan and and Iowa and, and across the country. Um, and um, one thing that I would like to focus on um, that we are that we have launched um, because. Um, Coming from a state energy office, uh, you know, really passionate about, you know, how do we help states address this issue? Um, we launched um, a siting workshop series. Davi had joined us last week, um, and we um, are hearing from states that they also lack resources and, capac and capacity to then turn in and help their local officials that desperately need it. So how do we create these, you know, forum, it's really critical that we create these forums to share best practices, to bring in experts, to talk about these challenges, to learn from each other. Um, so we uh, um, launched this last year and we're continuing to host these um, forums uh, where we talk about state-led programs, um, community engagement, community benefits, um, land use, all of these critical challenges. And um, you know, there are really, um, really innovative um, and really cool solutions. We have the, um, the Pennsylvania um, University Extension. They have created this um, virtual reality technology to, to show local officials what this could look like. Let's show them what the solar um, facility will look like when it's fully constructed and, and the screening is, is, is grown. Um, seeing is believing, right? And, and we've heard from um, uh, you know, some colleagues in Wisconsin at, the, at their university extension connecting local officials to, to um, you know, bring folks on, on, a, on a tour to say, okay, I have an operational wind facility, come see mine. And, and you know, my dogs aren't barking all night and the cows are still milking, right? Um, this, we're living near this and that is a much, trust, a much more trusted source of information. You're talking to your neighbor rather than hearing it from a developer, right? Um, so there are some really interesting solutions um, some really, you know, um, some, you know, some some best practices to share with each other, and some challenges that we still need to address. Um, and this is going to, um, you know, take a um, a, a network of folks. A DOE um, can't and shouldn't be in every community. And and as Davi said, you know, the um, the the messenger is really that trusted messenger is really critical. Um, and so we are also developing, you know, um, you know, um, new new technologies, new solutions. We have various funding opportunities to kind of pilot these ideas and monitor them and see what kind of impact they make. Um, you know, I think we really need to to explore and to um, um, give folks a sense for what benefits they could they could expect in their community and kind of le level that playing field. So when they're in a discussion w about a project, they have state-of-the-art information and, and there's um, you know, increased kind of fairness and transparency in that process. Um, and you know, I would also like to say that um, a lot of these projects will be, the majority of these projects will be built on private lands as we're talking about today, but there will be public land development as well. So working with our federal um, partners and agencies like um, 
Bureau of Land Management, Department of Interior, um, and working with our national labs to help them plan for, um, you know, optimizing development on public lands as well. Um, and I will just wrap up to overwhelm you with all of the resources. <laughs> um, there's, like I said, there's a lot that, that predates uh, my work for, it's been going on for a decade as far as, you know, surveying um, attitudes of, of members of communities that live near these projects and creating guidebooks and um, some of these funding opportunities, um, some really interesting um, simulation planning tools, and, and it's called Engage, and we've, we've um, uh, I've launched that and worked with Hawaii State Energy Office. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'm be happy to chat with you. But we are really hoping that we can, you know, create these state-of-the-art resources and information, have a one-stop shop for siting for folks to come and get this information, and then you know, work with um, partners to to create these networks and 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 make sure people are are able to access and use this information. Um, and I would say, again, stakeholder engagement is, is constantly ongoing. So i um, love to chat with, with you all to make sure that we are, are doing um, you know, the, the most that we can. I will wrap it up there. Good. All right. So I want to name a few things. And I really want to see if you all have questions. We can certainly, I can generate some if we need to. But I'd love to hear what's on your mind. So I, I think what we want to raise about this topic is the fact that it really cuts right in the middle of federalism as the United States' is, its governance is designed. And there are fundamental questions about what is, say, in the offshore wind space, what's the balancing role of BOEM between commercial fishing and a new energy and very important development, offshore wind, where there are, in fact, some sort of shared interests and some very significant conflict. And what is the role of BOEM or an agency like that to balance? How do they engage with their sister agency, NOAA NIMPS? Big questions there. On the federalism side, really for land-based siting, we really wrestle with the question because most of this is really at the state and local level. The feds, you know, on federal land, sure, transmission, you know, FERC in terms of, you know, sort of interstate, et cetera. But a lot of this is what is the relationship between the state and locales and who gets to have the power to make decisions, not only about if, but how and when. So if we give full authority to communities, and many of us in this room probably believe in grassroots, in supporting communities, communities get a say, it is very important for the populace, for citizen engagement, all those things. We give all the power to communities. My guess is a lot of stuff won't get built. On the other hand, if we take away that power and we impose things on people, we start walking right into the rural-urban divide and other factors, and states impose, say, a backstop, which could be valuable. So we can't just necessarily know at whim. On the other hand, then we get into a big question about not giving communities more local control and say over the place in which they live and work and play and raise their children. So there are hard questions here I think we face, and we'd love you to challenge us with some of those with either examples or questions. The panel can talk about them. But this is not an easy problem, and it's going to get harder and harder. And in some ways, there may be a cumulative effect going on around land-based wind where there's more and more of it and more and more communities saying, is that maybe too much? Um, so I don't know if, Dov, you want to respond, and then we'll, yeah, yeah we'll one, take some questions. Maybe one provocative, maybe one, <laughs> maybe one provocative thing that I'll <laughs> say to kick off questions, which is I think it's fair to say that if the status quo remains, we will not be able to build enough clean energy in the United States to do what we need to do. It, it is, it, we are losing ground very rapidly, very rapidly with counties and town, townships rejecting or restricting clean energy projects. So the urgency is, I, I want to I maybe kick off with, with that urgent urgency, acknowledging everything Pat said about some of the trade-offs that are really challenging. Take the gentleman in the back, and I was going to work my way forward. Do we have mics for folks, or are we just going to shout it out, which is okay by us, too? Okay, sir, standing up. How about it? Yep. Um, excuse me, welcome to everyone. My name is Peter Green with Green Green. Um, I guess the thing that makes me feel like we need to figure out ways for these facilities to become embedded in the culture of the local folks. And one thing that has not been talked about, and obviously I, I, have, I work in this space and I think about this stuff a lot, is when are companies going to come to the table and offer stock and dividends to local residents? And ownership. So if you're saying to me, if I'm a local resident in upstate New York, um, and this area has been gutted out for a certain amount of years, and it used to be a railroad that went through here, all these other dynamics, if the company comes in and says, listen, your children will get a stock, and we regularly produce a dividend, and that is yours. And now we're going to also offer you the workforce opportunities and the opportunities to weigh in on other tiny little elements. But that would completely change the dynamic. And I've worked with some of these companies and, and uh, consulted and advised some. Nobody has put that on the table. So I'm putting that in this room right now to say someone needs to put that on the table. 
Davi, having worked for a company, yes. Well, we, we didn't offer stock in, in the company. We're a private company. Um, but we did offer this royalty, at least in this experiment. And so that was a very similar concept. That would have paid out to the community over the 30-year life of the project, 1% of the revenue from the project. We estimated it would be somewhere around $200,000 a year, although it might have been more or less, depending on what project was built and how profitable it was. We did try that. And I will tell you that while I think that idea is worth exploring further, for sure, and I think ownership of a facility is a really interesting idea that's really hard to pull off right now. Um, as a competitive industry, it's, it's hard to do that. Um, but I, I will say that we did hear a lot of feedback uh, when we offered that royalty from the folks who were less enthusiastic about the project that sounded sort of like, you can't buy my soul take your money and shove it. <laughs> you know, we, 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 this is about, this is about, this is about our sense of place. <laughs> uh, I want the mayor wants to respond, then I've got a question here and a hand over here. So yes, mayor. Yeah, just really, just really quickly. The mic problem's contagious. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so I think what you're hitting on is for sort of the nub of the conundrum, which is what's being proposed in most of the scenarios we're talking about are uh, facilities whose benefits are broadly distributed but the cost or the negative externalities are are not nearly as broadly distributed they're felt primarily in the place right and there are lots of implications for that there are, we haven't talked about ej considerations and any of this stuff but it's that's that's all there right um and so what do you do to so you're getting at a mitigation question, which is really in, important, right? So what's in it for us is, is a very legitimate question that local folks can ask. But I think it also starts at even more fun. It, that's not a complete answer. One of the answers that I, I think has to, the question that has to be addressed is, so like, why us? Why are you putting this facility here when it can possibly conceivably go in other places? And I think getting at that answer really early in the process is important. And the answer may, people aren't unreasonable, right? I, at least I've run for public office thinking that people are, you know, primarily good and, and primarily, and, and for the most part, pretty reasonable if you deal respectfully uh, with them. I will say this, uh, people need to understand the, the broader implications right up front, right at the beginning of the discussion. They may not still like it, but if you say, well, this, 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 um, for instance, the high power cables have to go through your town because there's no other safe way to do it. And if we don't do it, we're not going to be able to distribute uh, effectively electricity that's generated from some renewable source, right? And so people, if you talk it through with them very early on, you, the chances of getting to yes are far, far greater in my experience. Um, I'll take if it's okay. I'll take. Um, they are having they they are having influence. Um, there are definitely examples, and there's been great reporting on some of them um, about uh, where we see we see actors that are funded by we suspect fossil interests coming to fight projects. But I I do like to point out that it's not that's not the whole story, and the way that that's actually working is. Those the resources provided by those entities are online, and sometimes there are people who know how to effectively prohibit projects. They've done it before. They travel the country. We know who they are. They have names. They're individuals. Um, they show up all over the place. I think you guys reported on one of them <laughs> uh, recently, and uh, and and that they are sort of trainers. But but the important thing to to know is that there's a lot of local people that are behind these efforts to kill these projects. They really are very local. They live in the community. They're very concerned. And I think there are there are sort of a couple archetypes that we see out there in in opposition. One one we see the folks that become ideologically invested in in killing clean energy. They believe that they are crusaders for communities. They're afraid of, you know, they they there's a whole lot of stuff you can find about how scary these things are. A lot of it's not true, but you can find a lot of it. And they become very impassioned. And they start developing whole identities around this. They run for office in, in many cases. You know, they this is a this is a leadership moment and they become important and known and, and they are very 
difficult to persuade. <laughs> They're probably not going to convince those folks, but they become organizers and are, are, are often quite effective. There's a group of people that's just reading these things that are scary and they're honestly scared and they don't really know what's true. Um, and that's where, you know, if we can figure out how to get trust from those folks or provide trusted sources for them, we can answer a lot of those questions and hopefully alleviate some of those concerns. That's they're really, really important folks to engage with. Then you've got folks who are ready to game it, so they're going to fight you until you pay them enough to go away. And there's always a, somebody like that out there. And and for a company, we're, we're often thinking of, well, when is the right time to pay that important person something to make them more satisfied? You know, and they're usually community members who 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 want to um, who want to negotiate kind of on behalf of a constituency. Um, and then and then last, I think that there are people who often have feedback that's really, really helpful. So somebody who knows something about this community that we don't know as outsiders, you know, maybe there's a wetland that's not there all the time that somehow we didn't have on our maps that they can tell us about. That's really important and valuable feedback. And so as a as somebody coming into a community, it's it's hard to figure out at first who's who um, in that spectrum. You know, outside agitators are one ex another example, I guess, of folks that are involved. But it's so important that for us to be there to be active, present, know the people, have the conversations. And, and so I, I guess one last thought on that is it takes so many resources to do that, to be on the ground with people and talking to people and having these conversations. It's a lot of resources to try to do that well in a community. And, and, and our industry right now, I don't think is doing a good enough job of putting the resources into that. Um, but it, so to answer your question, they have a role, but they're definitely not the whole story. I want to say one thing. I'll go to the question here, and maybe Kinder wanted to respond as well. I think as mediators, like Brad and myself, we think a lot about how people get trusted information. Um, and there's lots of tools and techniques we go into. We don't need to describe them now. But it is becoming increasingly difficult um, because it turns out, like, people think if we just give people enough information, we just tell them enough, they'll, they'll be convinced. And that is rarely, rarely true. It turns out facts are not stubborn things. Minds are stubborn things. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that was really striking about some of the surveying we did in Vermillion was one response really sat hard with me but home, which is we said, like, who were trusted sources of information? We said, is it more local? Is it more national? Is it more NGOs? Is it your state university? And one person responded, trust nobody but yourself. So if we live in a world in which we only trust ourselves to make broad, complex judgments, we have a problem how democracy can operate. And so it, you know, this when we do these citing problems, they land in the middle of, I think, the challenges in this country that are really troubling and we need to continue to really think hard about as well. So Brad, I don't know if you want to respond to Kendra and then I want to go to the comment there. Uh, yeah, uh, the sound system will catch up, I think. Um, but uh, actually, uh, let me hear from Kendra. Yeah, yeah, I would just say very quickly that um, to build off Dav Davi's points, that you can Im imagine the immense pressure that these local officials are under to make this decision that they, with all of this um, information and misinformation, to make the right decision for their community. Um, so I think we need to do, um, yeah, uh, you know, a much better job of also proactively engaging with these communities so they have a, a, a foundational understanding of the technology before they need to think about a specific project, right? That's a lot of education to think about, um, you know, and, and these local officials are not, uh, for the most part, clean energy experts, and they're dealing with um, so many decisions for their communities um, outside of the energy space. So how can we make sure that, you know, kind of, uh, I think collectively we can just do a lot more and, um, and, um, and one local official, you know, said last week, it, it's more than a commercial with a wind turbine, right? We need um, to to prepare these communities because this tr transition will will happen, um, you know, very quickly. And I go back. So to one of the ways in which a collaborative or consent-based siting process has to be as very intuitive and finely tuned is trying to suss out what needs to be true or how close the community is to being able to participate in the kind of evidence-based process that it, it sounds like um, the his honor to the mayor to my right would insist on and is in a position to um, kind of convene and cultivate. Um, as I, a very visceral experience I had in Vermilion County was um, sitting in on one of a, a public meetings convened by um, the Area Planning Commission. 
uh, and we had made kind of a tactical decision to sit back and let this process weigh out. But it was a, a conventional town hall meeting with people waiting for their five minutes at the microphone, um, an overstuffed room, air conditioner broken down, hot summer night. So it was an intense experience for the people who were there. And I, I didn't have a formal role, but I introducing myself to my neighbors. I wasn't going to fall, you know, sail under a false flag. Uh, when I sat down, someone handed me a flyer, a one pager, um, you know, sketch of a windmill with a line through it. We don't want them here, um, and all kinds of claims about the deleterious effects of this technology, this infrastructure. No citations. So I, I, I asked people, where'd this come from? Um, how can, you know, I, I genuinely want to learn what it took to get you as concerned as you are. Um, help me follow in your footsteps. And the answer was basically someone gave it to me. Um, and so I just became aware cognitive bias was lighting up all around me. And the conditions weren't right for people to have a conversation uh, and look at the same body of evidence and reach anything like or be reasoning the same way even if they... It, uh, interpreted it differently because of whatever interests. <coughs> I'm Neela Banerjee. I'm a climate editor at NPR. This is a space about misinformation and citing that we have done a lot of reporting on, including Flood Light. We will continue to put our eyes on that one. Um, I, I don't feel. An example that is um, not a renewable energy project per se, but a project that has climate implications, right? And it has to do with, uh, it was a municipal solid waste um, processing site. Um, so one was proposed in uh, a few years ago in our industrial park and it would it was it would consist of a municipal solid waste uh, processor as well as a biosolids processor. Um, not the best place. I'll just uh, stipulate uh, that it wasn't it wasn't well thought out, and there wasn't frankly a whole lot we could do um, about it. Um, Massachusetts is getting out of the business of permitting landfills as well as incinerators, and so municipal. Uh, processing sites that entail having trucks come in with municipal uh, with solid waste and having it packaged and sent out on rail cars elsewhere to places that will take it is really the way that a lot of states in the Northeast are going. Um, there was a, a great deal of, there was a pretty pointed backlash. Um, and, uh, you know, I, my, my feeling on it was there were, there were, it, it wasn't. We're we're sort of a really built out city. We're a city of over a hundred thousand. There isn't a whole lot of places to be for these sites to be put, and it really should have gone elsewhere. But so be it. We're we're dealt a hand. Um, my the way that I navigated was I just sort of took a look at you know our likelihood of success in um, uh, prevailing and in, in convincing the state that it wasn't the right place. Um, those the, my prospects look pretty low, and so, and I'll just say this is just a practical political position that I took. I we spent a lot of time saying, in effect, hell no, it's not going to happen. But knowing that eventually that entity was going to come to the table, and what we negotiated was, um, or the, the most generous host community agreement of its type in the Northeast for one of these facilities that included not just annual payments. That were would be split to the as between the city's general fund and um, a revolving fund that would be used for um, 
uh, construction of playgrounds and sidewalks and things in the immediate neighborhood, but also uh, most favored nation pricing arrangement whereby when our landfill is eventually capped, as they all are getting in, in the Northeast, that we could go, we could send our garbage to this facility pretty cheaply. And so that's a direct, sort of a direct answer to your question, but it took a whole lot of, a whole lot of political navigating to get to that point in a place where you can, because you have a, a, a strong mayor model of government, you can do that. You can't do that everywhere. If I could, um, maybe I'll tweet you out, Mark, but if I could take my uh, U.S. Department of Energy hat off and put my former NYSERDA hat back on for a minute, um, um, that was my day-to-day, -to -day, right? I think that we, we saw um, many communities go through this process, and as a state energy official, we were not there to tell a community to permit this project or to not permit this project. But so often these communities had the same questions. They were wondering about... Um, and, you know, very, very skeptical at first, but then they were wondering about decommissioning um, agreements. They were wondering about host community agreements. They were wondering about the safety of the battery energy storage that may have been paired with a large, with the solar system. They were curious about what is this, how does this impact my agricultural land, right? There was a, a, a host of, you know, a laundry list we could go down of real concerns. And it wasn't just one meeting. It was, you know, uh, for some of these towns, it was five, six meetings, but providing information, providing, um, you know, some real um, real resources, not just fact sheets, but real resources. Um, for example, how, what economic benefit can, um, can we get from this project? And giving them a starting point based on, you know, um, where in, the, we created a calculator at NYSERDA to, to, to help folks come to the table and understand, okay, I can ask for X amount of dollars per megawatt based on the utility uh, a zone that I'm in. And so getting them to come to the table with some more resources, a better understanding. I saw countless communities um, in upstate New York kind of go through this process. Um, and then I think, you know, the, 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 the proof is in the project pipeline. Um, that's just New York State. But I, I do know, you know, when we're talking about trusted messengers, um, some, some research has shown that utilities and state energy offices are much more trusted by local officials than, um, you know, nonprofits and developers, for example. So, um, yeah, happy to talk to you more about that. Um, but that was just my experience in New York State. Got it. Yeah, and this doesn't answer your question exactly, exactly but um, I think it's relevant. The projects are getting built, and the science, the research has shown that once they're built, people actually, a lot of those fears go away. And I think that's important. It really is important to mention that because there's a lot of contention and concern about what might happen. We have 80,000 turbines, for example, spinning in the U.S. right now. And, you know, that should pr be providing some good evidence um, that this actually isn't going to bring all the things that folks are afraid it's going to during development. People are happy with their projects for the most part after they're built. And I think that's maybe relevant to your question. Uh, maybe I'll do one really quick story to close about positive because we don't want to be all negative as you all leave the room, heads dejected, you know, sobbing. We don't want that. Um, an offshore wind space, which is a little bit different than community by community, um, uh, and I'll give a shout out to the company and the, the fishermen. There was a site off in New York um, that Equinor, uh, uh, essentially the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway, had, uh, had developed. And they, fishermen were very unhappy with it. This is primarily the mixed trawl fishery, so it was squid, buttercup, and other things. Uh, and they really, um, the, the, uh, the company uh, came to the fishermen, the fishermen came to the company and said, let's look at this site. And let's see if we can figure out within the site that we're allowed to build in if we can't do something that would actually satisfy everybody's interests. So they went through a series of, you know, really non-public fisherman developer conversations. They brought all of their kind of array designers from Norway to come and be in the meeting. This is just before COVID. Um, and they had long conversations and they went home and they re-engineered and they re-talked. They went back and forth and they redesigned the project to really accommodate fishing inside part of the array by removing some turbines, moving some turbines further, I think, to the east. Um, and, and in a way that the fishermen felt not they don't love it, but they feel a lot better about it. And Equinor feels like it will work and it will make money and it does what it needs to do. And it actually met some sort of uh, some design issues around some of the wind and the, the wake effect that happens you know, behind turbines. And it was, I think, a very successful outcome for a very, very particular project with a very particular company. And the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, which is a group of fishermen who sometimes sue for offshore wind development, but also try to engage. We're also really good at engaging with Equinor to try to solve the problem. So it is possible. It takes commitment, it takes leadership, it takes time, and it takes, I think, to the first gentleman who asked the question, it takes a company willing sometimes to eat a little bit into the profit, and that is not an easy thing for many companies because they have investors and responsibilities. Um, but it, I think it is possible. 